In this unit, we're going to look at virtual machines. I'm going to look at some of the ideas behind what a virtual machine is. We're going to look at two different types of virtual machines, so process virtual machines and uh, system virtual machines. And we're going to think about a little bit about why we might use them. Okay, so that's the kind of plan. So virtual machines are in, uh, any instance where software used to take on the function of a machine, including executing intermediate code or running operating system within, within another. So that's the kind of thing you have to uh, learn from the spec. So what is a virtual machine? Now, you might have heard the term before. Um, you might have even used them to maybe run uh, Linux on your Windows PC or uh, maybe even Hackintosh, um, should you be that way inclined. Um, but a virtual machine will run on a normal PC, okay? And we'll call this a host. Now, this essentially, you can think of it like a, a kind of a virtual computer inside your own computer. So it's like running an entire brand new computer, um, which is completely separate or sandboxed away from your main system, okay? Because it's sandboxed, it will have a virtual version of everything. So we'll have a virtual processor, we'll have a virtual set of memory, it will have a virtual storage device, it will have uh, virtual network devices and all those cool things. Now they will actually use the real ones. So the virtual hard disk inside a virtual machine will have a file stored on your real hard disk, but the virtual machine cannot access anything outside of that file, okay? So it's sandbox, it's locked down. So it is a self-contained operating environment which makes use of host hardware. So it uses the host hardware, but it restricts access to it. This is one of the reasons why virtual machines can be used for testing things which might normally break your system. So for example, if you were designing antivirus software, um, you may wish to run it inside a virtual machine. That way, if the virus, uh, antivirus failed and the virus got through, um, the worst comes to worst, it will break the virtual machine. Well, you can then delete the virtual machine and start again without damaging the uh, initial host computer. So in order to make virtual machines run, you need uh, special software, okay? And what it will do is you'll run this software, you'll create the virtual machine inside that software, and then it will obviously execute it. And it will then manage um, the access to uh, hardware and uh, files and things like that, okay? And you as a user uh, of that virtual machine can sectionally configure those, those, those kind of uh, configurations. It abstracts or virtualizes your hardware, okay? So it bridges the hardware. Now, for example, um, you might have a, a Wi-Fi connection uh, inside on your laptop, which you use to connect to the internet and things like that. Um, it will then kind of create a bridge to that. So inside the virtual machine, it will um, have a virtual network device and that will make use of your Wi-Fi connection, but it's not using the Wi-Fi device directly. It's going via the virtual machine. That way, you can easily switch it on and off through the virtual machine um, should you wish to. Programs running in the virtual machine are sandbox, meaning they can only access what we allow it to do. So another example might be that you might set the virtual machine to have two gigabytes of RAM, but you might have eight gigabytes. Now, no matter what that virtual machine tries to do, it won't be able to access beyond those two gigabytes, okay? That is actually really, really helpful because um, you don't want a virtual machine kind of taking over the entirety of your system. So that's kind of like the idea behind it. There are two types of virtual machine which um, are, are used at the moment, process and system. You need to know about both of them and they're both used for different purposes. So a, a system virtual machine is where we'll take an entire operating system, Linux, Windows, whatever it happens to be, and essentially have a, a, a kind of whole system on your own one. So we will call that a guest system. So inside a guest system, it will be sandboxed, but it will be usable in the same way you use a normal computer. Okay, so you'll have, uh, you'd have your uh, operating system in there, you'd have your application installed, and all those kind of things. A process virtual machine, however, only creates a virtual machine for a single application. Okay, um, and this is commonly uh, used for uh, programming languages such as Java, but also other things like Python and things like that. And what that does is it will sandbox that application and again restrict what application can do but it will then run instead of running um, your normal machine code instructions it runs something called bytecode that bytecode or intermediate code is compiled first 
and then run through the virtual machine. Okay, and we'll kind of explore that in a bit more detail what that looks like. Let's think about a um, system virtual machine. So what I have at the um, moment is I've got um, a, a Mac that's running Linux. So the Mac is the original computer, the actual physical computer I was using to take this screenshots. I'm then using a piece of software called VirtualBox, which is free software, which allows you to uh, do virtual machines, create virtual machines for yourself. And what I did is I created a virtual machine on there. I installed Linux onto that virtual machine. And as you can see, on the left hand side, I have got that virtual machine. So as you see here, I've got my uh, Linux guest. So this is the guest operating system and it is a full version of Linux. You can see I've got the desktop there. I've got my uh, uh, kind of software installer there and all that kind of thing. But actually this is really a Mac. And you can see here, I've got uh, another window open, which is just for Mac, just to prove that actually this is just uh, just a window. Okay, so this here is essentially, as far as the Mac is concerned, just another application, but actually it's a full system. So system virtual machines will allow a full operating system, another computer to run inside the machine. Okay, now there are a few rules for it. Um, now it must run the same CPU architecture. So for example, you can't, have a x86 architecture, so your normal kind of architecture you expect on a uh, laptop. It can't run ARM. So for example, you can't create a virtual machine which will run an ARM program, okay? What you would have to do is almost emulate it. Now emulation and virtualization are not the same thing. However, they can be combined, okay? So it does not emulate CPU. It actually runs directly on the CPU. It's just sandbox. The virtual machine will create a bridge between that host hardware, okay? So here, uh, what I've got is a screenshot. And what I've done is inside that Linux virtual machine, I've literally just shown you, I ran a, pro, a, a file, I'm sorry, a program called LSPCI. And what it does is list out all the cards connected, the PCI cards connected. And as you can see, um, it's got some um, uh, information in there, um, but you'll see, that some of this is actually to do with VirtualBox. Okay, so what VirtualBox is doing is it's creating virtual versions of all my hardware. So it's kind of like making that bridge towards it. So it's controlling um, what Linux can see, and what Linux can use, and how it's going to use it. So there's no way Linux can get access to things it, it's not allowed to do. Now, the process virtual machines is, is something slightly different. It will run a single program or process. Remember, the word process essentially means a running program. So when running software, you might compile your software into machine code. As we know, um, compilation is the process of taking source code into machine code. For process virtual machine, we do something ever so slightly different. Now, machine code will only work on a specific architecture, so ARM or x86, and for a specific operating system. So if I compiled a program on x86 Windows, it won't run on x86 Mac. It just won't. Because of that, we can do something ever so different. So instead of compiling into machine code, we compile into something called intermediate code. This intermediate code won't run on any processor that exists. Okay, you can think of it like a virtual machine code, okay, or a generic machine code. But because it won't run on anything, it requires interpretation. Okay, so it needs an interpreter to actually run and come turn that machine that, that that kind of intermediate code into real machine code. Okay, so we have this weird situation where we both compile and interpret at the same time. So intermediate code always requires an interpreter, but we call that the virtual machine. Okay, it's commonly referred to as a virtual machine, but essentially it is an interpreter. Intermediate code will produce by different languages, meaning that we could have different modules written in different languages, but integrated through intermediate codes. What this means, it's a little bit complicated, but what it means is uh, I might have different languages. Okay, so maybe um, C++ and uh, I don't know, Python, which then compiles down into this intermediate code, and then I can put those modules together to form one final program. This is very common, um, but it can happen specifically with the .NET frameworks.
Anyway, so let's see um, the difference, okay, going under the hood a little bit. So imagine I've written two programs, okay, hello world, okay, programs which we, we can write easy peasy. And I've written it twice. I've written it in a C. So as you can see here, I've got my C program, okay, I'm importing the standard uh, input and output and just printing it out. And then I'm doing the same in Java. Okay, so those of you who are familiar with Java, you'll be familiar with this, this kind of command. Okay. Um, so the difference here is that C will compile directly into machine code, which means that the executable file that's generated from this will only work on the um, system that I created it on. So in this example, I code this on Linux. So it'll work on my x86 Linux PC. If I try to run it on Windows, it just will fail. The reason for this is because when you compile a program in a specific operating system, it makes use of operating system calls, okay? And that changes the machine code itself, okay? So if um, I try to run it on um, uh, Windows or Mac, what happens to be, the operating system calls will be different, and no go, it will fail. However, Java works differently. It compiles it into intermediate code. This intermediate code can be run on any system I want to, as long as I've installed the Java virtual machine. Now in Java, this intermediate code is known as bytecode, okay? If I disassembled my C program, I turned it back into machine code or assembly code in this example, okay, because machine code is not very nice to look at, um, you can see um, that is x86 machine code. OK, so I'm not going to explain that machine code, but it is just machine code assembly code. But the bytecode, however, you can see is much more generic. OK, um, it's actually explained a lot more. OK, so because it's generic, it's not designed to run on a CPU. Um, it, it can be a bit more descriptive and they've got a bit more flexibility on that. OK, um, but this is then uh, compiled. Now, you can see these two are very, very different. They, they, they've got nothing in common, even though they're doing exactly the same thing in reality. So bytecode and um, machine code are not the same thing at all. Okay, Machine code will run on a specific operating system and architecture, whilst bytecode will only, will, won't run on anything without a virtual machine or an interpreter to actually run it. So, on uh, line uh, uh, 400,531, okay, so this one here, okay, uh, I might actually use a different way of showing that. So you see here, this line here, um, this is going to take the string, okay, and pass it into a register called EDI, okay. It will then invoke the library code for printf, which is this call Q. So that's going to call the operating system code to print onto the command line, um, and then we'll use that register. On the bytecode, okay, line zero is accessing um, system.out. So that's the um, in in Java, it's known as the IO stream. Um, then it loads up the string, and then finally invokes virtual will essentially run that function. So the process actually, think about it, is very similar. It's getting the string, send it to a function, bang, there it goes. But the code looks very, very different. Python um, will...
So to kind of finish off, um, we have different uses for both system and process virtual machines. So process virtual machines, okay, can be developed once and then run on many, many different systems. So for example, I might code something on a Windows um, um, computer and then run it on Linux and Mac um, without having to change my code. It allows the advantages of both compiling and interpreting. So compiling, remember, it will hide your source code. Okay, so you don't have to kind of share that. Um, and obviously, if I'm compiling into uh, bytecode, again, I'm hiding that source code. Um, interpreting allows us to do other things, such as running on different systems without having to recompile it. Um, but also, um, it allows us to find errors really quickly, because when it's running it line by line, it'll stop or ask an error and give you translate diagnostics. It allows additional security checks to be run as the code runs. So because it's a virtual machine, it's still sandboxed. Okay, so it can restrict access to files, hardware, networking uh, things, and all those kind of things. So that enables additional security. Um, so some examples of languages which will make use of bytecode are Python and Java, um, but there are others out there. System vir uh, virtual machines um, allows to test potentially dangerous software like antivirus software and if that virtual machine becomes compromised, then we can delete the virtual machine or roll back that virtual machine so we, we won't damage the host PC that it was on. It allows us to isolate um, systems from each other. So I might have multiple virtual machines running on a single computer um, and each one is running completely, something completely different. So if one gets compromised, the others are still safe. Okay, So although they are still talkative with one another, um, they won't necessarily all be compromised at the same time. So that can be a safer way of um, um, having system critical software like databases. Um, it can be used to run software which is not designed for the host operating system. So for example, I might run a Linux application inside Windows and vice versa. Okay, 